Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm here uh, uh, with the uh, Alenza Day uh, Conversations in Information Architecture, and I have the honor and uh, privilege uh, of talking to the radiant Jordan Green. Jordan, thank you so much for joining me. You're so funny. <laughs> You're so funny. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and um, Jordan, it's uh, I, as we've been talking about it, you know, we've been following each other on Twitter for a while and yeah. just, I'm excited to finally get to chat uh, with you yeah. about a topic near and dear to both our hearts, uh, information yeah. architecture. I know for me, as long as I've been doing this, it's still hard to help people understand the IA process and what they mm -hmm. get out of it. How would mm -hmm. you, what, which part of the process do you find most difficult to explain? What is it What is it that you think folks and the folks who are maybe not steeped in IA find it most difficult to understand about the work that we do? I think, I think it's one of those invisible things, right? It's a, uh, it's behind the scenes a lot and it's not glorious. It's very, very hard. And so people tend to like, it's hard and then it's invisible. So selling people on it and the importance of it only happens when you can show rather than tell. Um, so I think oftentimes what I see happen is like when I'm talking with stakeholders, I'm like, hey, we really need to figure out, um, I deal with a lot of nonprofits and folks who are doing like uh, they're visioning new worlds for their clients or collaborate. Um, and oftentimes they have like a resource library, right? And they'll have this resource library. And the first thing I ask them is like, who maintains the resource library? And usually there's no one in the organization that's responsible for maintaining the resource library, right? And it's like everybody points at everyone else. And so I'll usually, when it comes time to do their websites will will go and I'll say, all right, so we, I, we, you have 800 resources in this resource library and you have, you have 50 categories, 50 tags and categories that you're using. And some of them are health, some of them are health and wellness. Like, how are you delineating those things? And the more and more we get into it, the more and more they realize how important just having some kind of structure or plan in place to help decide where things go is important. But if I tell someone like, hey, you need to make sure that your taxonomy is like really robust before we even approach this, they just start, they just look at me kind of blankly. And maybe it's the word taxonomy, but like, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you don't, uh, my co-member uh, co, uh, owner, because I work for a cooperative, Gabe, he's our tech person. He has this really great phrase that I've adopted and it's like, it's not important until it is. And then I, I, yes, and IA is like, it's not important until it is, right? And people think that, you know, everyone can have a website or things like that. And it, it's just easy and magic and you do the thing. That's where it gets hard to sell people on it. What I like about what you're saying is when we talk about showing IA, we're usually talking about like, looking at like left-hand navigation, like, look, here's, yeah. here's what I mean, but it's not only this, right? And yeah. what you've described is showing them by getting them to do the process. All right, let's dig into yeah. your tags. Let's dig into these yeah. tags and let's start to look yeah. at what's going on with these tags. Do you find like, yeah. in a sense, they've got to roll their sleeves up and get their hands in the mud to deal yeah. with these tags? Do you find like, are people willing and able and um, I guess, um, ready to embrace that messiness? No. And yes, like the no, the no right away. It's like, that's why they hire us. Right. right. Cause they're like, no, I don't want to do this by myself. I don't feel confident. I want someone who knows what they're doing to come in and show me what to do. But, um, at story two, where I work, um, the whole thing, we're collaborative. We're a collaborative organization, we're a cooperative. And I really wanna break down the idea of there being experts. Like we live in the information, there are experts, people who have trained and focused really hard and studied on a particular area. So they're able to sift through a bunch of information really quickly, that's why you hire us. But also like the we live in the world wide web, we all need to have the ability to 
navigate certain bits of information and find the things that we need. We need to be able to Google effectively. We all need to right. improve our Google food. And so when we do these collaborative processes, my hope is that I'm teaching people, hey, like this isn't as scary as you're making it out to be. And at a certain point, if you, if this is tingling something in the back of your mind, like maybe you can actually start on your own journey around learning how to organize and categorize information because we're often working with, um, at, at the cooperative, we're actually working with folks who are very little resource. I think like I've seen IA really be applied in places that have a lot of resources like schools, universities, um, libraries, and those are lots of like, those are resource. Right, but then also um, like companies, huge companies use big enterprise, use IA right. a lot. Um, but when you're dealing with folks who are doing like community-based nonprofits or even maybe sort of grass top nonprofits, they're so beleaguered, but they wanna get all this information out there. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it is helpful to have this collaborative process where we help, we invite, we don't make them do the work, but we, give them a taste of it, right? So we're not, we're not necessarily, I used to cook with my grandma. She wouldn't let me actually <laughs> like cook the whole meal, right? No. But she would let me be her sous chef and like chop the onions and taste things along the way. And that gets people excited and gets them to like dig into the work a little bit more and respect the process, I think. Cooking is not a metaphor that we use enough in the IA world. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think I do a lot of cooking and I feel like um, there's one of the things that appeals to me about cooking is it is such a process that you are, uh -huh. and you must have been able to watch your grandma do this sort of constantly course correct. Like as mm -hmm. you're tasting the meal, you're like, that's mm -hmm. not quite right. Let mm -hmm. me do, let me add this or let me turn the heat down mm -hmm. or whatever it is I need to do. And I find that is such a good metaphor for the IA process as a whole. Yeah. It's like, okay, yeah. we've uncovered these weird categories here. I think we should spend more time on that, even though we didn't even imagine that that's what we were gonna do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so much of my work, you know, it's interesting because when I, I, I was telling you before we started that I'm a career switcher, right? Mm -hmm. And so well, my background was as a facilitator and as a, like, as a workshop presenter. So I had that. And then before that, in another life, I was a theater major. So I had this, like, ability to interact with people, um, sort of, like, really baked deep into my being, right? And um, what I found when I started doing IA and started really helping people figure out their structures um, on their websites was that it was really helpful to have those skills of like course correcting live and improving in the moment, right? Because if you get a bunch of stakeholders in the room and you're helping them decide like, this is the structure of the thing. So I love, um, I love the frontline worker who has been working at an organization forever and knows the organization in and out, but nobody listens to that worker for whatever reason, right? That's my fate, that is, my heart sings for that person, right? Because right. they really truly believe in the work and they have insights uh, that usually people who are in management or whatever, what have you, don't necessarily have right? because they're removed from the work at that level. And when you get them in the room with management, they usually have a totally different perspective on organizing and understanding and getting them to say like, but what about this extremely rare use case to management that I see presents itself on a daily basis on the front line. It gets everybody to sort of think about the work differently, right? And that's what I really enjoy about having this sort of collaborative process of doing IA, whether that's a card sort or whether that's like digging in the tags or what, whatever, what have you. It really allows people to come together and say, oh, why we're really trying to center other people, not ourselves, not our own processes. So yeah. I and mean, you have to course correct constantly with that yeah. kind of stuff because people just throw you curveballs all the time and it's great, it's great. Is there a favorite, I like that you're talking about sort of bringing people with different perspectives into the room and, and yeah. you know, uh, 
universally, there's sort of different levels of the organization and management looks different from the worker, looks even different from the executive. And right. what, yeah. what are your favorite tools for sort of making sure everybody has a voice in that process? Yeah, we do a meeting call. We have a couple of meetings um, when we start on a web build. We have a couple that we like to do. The discovery share out, right? So we usually work with folks. Uh, we have a discovery phase. It's about a month. We're going through, we're talking to people. We're reading all of their articles. We're doing all of this stuff, right? Um, and when we go through and look at their work, we discover, because we're outsiders, we discover things that we're like, you have this, resource over here no one's touched in like four years right but it's central to your resource library for whatever right. reason yeah. right? what's the deal with that right and you'll get um and so in the discovery share out meeting we we start with this is what we found and everybody hates it because it's like going to the dentist or the doctor after you haven't gone in like 10 years right yeah. they're like you have <laughs> you know you have high blood pressure and you're like well, I eat a double cheeseburger every day for right. lunch, so not surprising, but I didn't. That's why I didn't come, because I knew you were <laughs> going to tell me bad news. <laughs> right, right. But we try to make it, like, super, super, um, not gentle, but, like, you know, inviting. Right. And so we invite people to say, like, hey, can you tell me the story around this resource? Can you tell me the story around, you know, we do this with branding, too, but can you tell me the story around your you know the way where did this page come from what happened here like why is this here and you know oftentimes people are some people are some clients are embarrassed right and they're just like throw everything out right but then you when you get folks that are working from different perspectives um we we say like what happens if we throw this out can we just think about this a little bit more who's impacted right and so that really gets a lot of people to help um, talk to each other. The other thing that we really do when we have multiple perspectives is um, Stanford and the East Bay Meditation Center and both in the Bay Area have these great rules for um, conversations around cross-cultural conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can find them, I'll send them to you. They're basically ground rules, right? So they're ground rules for like, you know, hey, assume good intent with folks when they're talking and oftentimes when you're working with people who have been entrenched in the work whether that's at the executive level or at the ground level there's a lot of miscommunication around intent right and so like executives are paying um, or director levels or whatever you call them they're paying attention to how can you make sure that the organization stays afloat right and continues to do what it does really well and the person who's at the ground level or the person who's doing the direct service are often dealing with the people who are coming directly in and need the service or need the thing. And both of them have a concern about maintaining the organization, but it's a very different approach to that concern. Sure. And so just helping people understand, like setting context, again, setting a context, a container for people to say like, hey, let's talk about each other's perspectives. and really use um, either a lens or something, use a, um, a, a central artifact as a grounding thing. So whether that's the discovery share out, um, when we do another meeting called the high, high level design, we share out a site map, a potential strategy of how we can go forward uh, with, the organi uh, with the website. Because really when you're dealing with a website nowadays, you're dealing with the public Pub the externalization of the organization structure, right? right? <laughs> and so a lot of politics come into play right away, right? Like, I want to be on the homepage. I want to be on the homepage. Or, you know, I think I should have this place in the menu way more so because in my experience, the users are looking for this. So that's where user research really helps with that. But yeah, ground rules and having ar tangible artifacts as nice. tangible as possible helpful uh so i want to talk to you now about uh the lens that you uh picked uh and i feel like the stuff that we've just been talking about is kind of a good transition mm -hmm. can you tell us what lens you picked and what about it uh or maybe describe it to us in your own words 
Yeah, so I picked institutional bias, and I, I actually picked a whole list of things, and this is the one we settled on. Um, I, I picked it for a couple of reasons, right? Like, I'm, I am a diversity. Uh, someone once was like, oh, you're, di you're diversity. And I was like, okay, great. And I love using that. I like being like, I am a diversity. But like, I'm a Black, queer, like non-binary person, right? So I have a lot of these lenses that I already, or focuses that I already have when I enter an organization. But then on top of that, um, having worked in a variety of different organizations over the years, what I've learned um, is that institutional bias is just the people who run the institution thinking that everyone thinks like them, right? And so um, it's a really interesting thing when you start getting to websites, right? Because oftentimes, um, especially in like uh, service uh, industry, um, people from community, uh, and not service industry, I should say like social services, folks from those backgrounds, you typically, what I've seen are two kinds of people, um, the majority of them. They're either folks who had an experience at one point in their life that really resonated with them, and they're not from the community that they serve or the population of people that they serve, but they're dedicated to those folks and they really believe that they're in the trenches with them side by side, right? Um, and that's sort of the field that they're in. Or two, they come from the communities that the organization serves in a variety of different ways and they're doing their best to provide the best services for people who have experiences very similar to them. They have a real lived experience. Mm -hmm. And both of those groups of people when they become entrenched in an institution, forget that they are not the client, right? They forget because they deal with the client every day, day in and day out, they forget that the client doesn't know like the weird acronym that you have to say to a grant maker or something like right. that, or the sort of political dance that you like all of this memory. And so what you end up having a lot of times on the websites are folks who are um, they have these like very small biases to, to how people should be navigating a website or understanding the website, right? Um, and my job <laughs> in a lot of ways is to come in and say like, hey, the way that you all treat your information is unique to you all, right? And what the user is looking for it's kind of like similar, like they're not just interacting with your organization. They're maybe interacting with a variety of different organizations throughout the day. And so let's let's whittle down this, what information is important for you all to transfer and what information is just like nice to have. So let's whittle those things down first. And like, how do we, how do we parse out all of this information um, in a way that doesn't make the user instantly feel off put by what you're asking them right. and also gets you honest information for the data collection that you're trying to do like both of those conversations need to happen almost simultaneously in parallel to each other right, at the same time. right. have you so, what is the most egregious example you can think of that you can share with us of oh yeah an organization's let's just say navigation um or maybe content um yeah having a real bias that yeah. suggests that they are sort of becoming detached from the, the user's needs. Yeah, so I this is one of my favorite examples. I used to work, uh, when I was fresh out of college, I was in AmeriCorps um, for the Office of Equity and Inclusion at the Oregon Health Authority, right? And so I was there and um, I was put on this project where we were sending out Medicaid forms to or Medicaid um, brochures, a huge packet of information to a variety of people across the state, right? And they, um, tore, as I was looking through, I got to the back and I noticed that there was all of these different languages, like printed languages in the back of the book. Right. And we, so we got to this meeting where we were editing it and I was just like, can we move this section that says, if you need this information in a different language to the front of the book? 
And I got pushback from people. We're all speaking English, right? right. And I'm like, we got pushback from these people on the call that were like, I don't see why that's important. And I was like, if you got a pamphlet in Cantonese, would you read 70 pages of Cantonese or flip through 70 pages of Cantonese looking for the English section of the book? Or would you just throw the book away? Right. And this is Medicaid, right? We're talking right. about people's health insurance. We're talking right. about access to dental care, right? Or, or access to health care. And everyone was like, oh my God, I never thought about it that way. And I was like, yeah, it was so <laughs> obvious to me, right? But, but you know, it, I think I think that's the problem is like, these were folks, they weren't all, and you could listen to the story and think, oh, these are all just sort of like white bureaucrats. They weren't, they were right. English, all monolingual, English speaking, diverse folks, or not monolingual, but everybody spoke English, right? right? And they just thought like, of course, and we're in Oregon. So they're like, of course, everybody reads English. And I'm like, no, if you're talking about populations of people who are accessing state services, we need to make sure that they can see their language up front, or at least see that the things are presented in multiple languages. Because it was only a brief blurb. It was about right. five or seven lines, right? But it was in all of these different languages and it gave everybody an opportunity, it clued people in like, oh, this is available to me in another in another language, right? right. And if right. they have, you know, if they have Arabic, maybe they actually also do have like Cantonese or maybe they actually do have like, you know, Spanish or even something that, or Russian, you know, cause those were the biggest populations of non-English speaking populations that we had in the state at the time. And so like, that's one of my favorite, it's a, that example now is I think, <laughs> I'm aging myself, that example is about 10 years old, but it, it, it stuck with me because it shows that even folks with good intentions and who care about the populations of people can have these small biases that they don't even really think about um, that per like persist. Um, another one that, one of my favorite ones that I love seeing in data collection is when you have man, woman, other, or like male, female, other gender. Um, that one is really fun because if you talk to, depending on who you talk to, right? Man and woman, male and female are different already, right? And so, but if you're talking to someone who's like trans or non-binary or anything like that, my thought, like when I fill out those forms, it's like, why do you need this information to begin with? Right, right? it should be optional then, anyway, yes. It should be optional anyway, but also it shouldn't be a drop-down field. Right. It, should be, it should be a short input, text input field, right? But when you're talking to people who are coding the data on the back end, they're like, I'm lazy. I don't want to have to parse through somebody's like uh, made up gender and figure out where to ca categorize, like, right. And everybody's gender is made up, but like, you know, right. whatever label they put on it and figure out how to categorize that. Yeah. But when I have run experiments like that in the past, what I find is that most people who know what their gender are will just say man, woman, or male or female, right? Because there's already confusion around those terms. But the people who are sort of the, the use cases that are outside of that binary feel so much more seen and so much more attuned to like, okay, there's someone in the organization who knows that this should, that this is important. And so I can potentially feel safe here and they'll put whatever they need to. And on the back end, the coding is actually much easier um, right. because we can, we can then separate it out into like man, woman, other, if we need to, or right. we can start getting this much more granular data about these user journeys and understand perspectives right. just by changing that little input field, right? But what I, what's interesting to me, both of your stories, I think, um, are ultimately, in my mind, as I as I listen to them, sort of about the same thing. And it's it's not even, I mean, it's even more than an institutional bias. It's a mm -hmm. systemic bias, right? It's this yeah, totally. it's this bias that's built into our culture. And yeah. with the language one, that's particularly interesting to me because um, certainly on federal forms, they're required to put it in all these different languages, but right. it definitely feels like the intent is to just tick them off, like just to say, okay, we did that, we met that requirement, but not mm -hmm. think deeply about 
who's using it and who might mm -hmm. make use of that language, right? So mm -hmm. we sort of yeah. we sort of translate accessibility requirements or inclusivity requirements into a, mm -hmm. a checklist, but mm -hmm. not really incorporate that thinking into um, into how we design these products. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I this is one of the soapboxes I think I can get on all day, right? Because I think uh, for me, inclusive design is ultimately future making, mm. right? And so you you have an opportunity to show people the future that you want in every little aspect of the thing that you do, right? You have a you have an opportunity to show people with a form. Like, hey, we see you. It's important for us to see you. We want a world in which, you know, you can speak your home language to an intake specialist and get the services that you need. Right. Right. Done. And that's a radical visioning of a future for some people, right? For other folks, it's like, hey, like, I see you. I understand that you move through the world a little bit differently than other people because your understanding of your gender, the journey that you've gone on is a little bit more nuanced than folks who just are like, yep, I'm a dude. I like guns. I'm sorry. I, that's what popped into my head. But like, you know, I like, wait, hold up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I'm a dude. I like comic books, D&D, &D, you know, and like, like, like let's make it a little bit yeah more for the npr crowd right instead of the, like <laughs> like for the hunting crowd but even that that's a bias yeah. right but like right. but um you know you the opportunity to say like if you want a world in which everybody is seen or in which everybody is sort of like even you and your weirdness is held you have to create a space for people to be held in their weirdness, whatever that is. Yeah. And so you have, a, when you're designing things, especially information or the way that information is laid out, you have an opportunity to, to future make an opportunity to say like, this isn't the only way we, you can access this information and help people understand like, even as you're giving us information, we're seeing you as a, it's a relationship. It's not just a, like uh, a transaction, you know? Nice. I yeah. think we will leave it there. Thank you. Okay, great. So cool. that was so great. I mean, obviously uh, we could keep talking literally yeah. all night long, but I got to go make dinner. So I got, I was like, I got to go to my next thing. I'm running five minutes late. Oh, oh sorry about Jordan. No, thank you much. Um, thank that you was so, so great. And I hope we get to chat again or maybe play D D or something at some. I yeah, if you yeah, if you want to do like a IA like one shot or something, that would be fun, right? Wouldn't that be your if you want to DM? Uh, uh, I don't play much D D. I play indie games. Uh, okay. Yeah, but even better. They're fun. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, we'll I love, catch up another time. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay. We'll do it another Bye. time. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Thank you. You too. Bye bye.